Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS, a show about building things with JavaScript. First of all, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year if you're watching this already in 2018. I wanted to do a short episode where I will talk about uh, my top of uh, JavaScript related technologies of 2017. So I don't just want to list any JavaScript related, like, you know, frameworks, technologies, whatever came out this year, but I want to actually pick the stuff that uh, changed the way I work, right? So, and uh, during a stream, we've picked a bunch of it and um, I just want to go through it real quick and uh, give you an overview of what I've been using basically the whole year and what changed the way I work with JavaScript. Maybe you'll find something useful here, maybe not. Um, and there will be a small um, survey at the end to help me make the channel better. So, you know, if you are not interested in this content, please do uh, jump to the end and answer the survey that should be in the video description. Uh, so thank you for that. And let's get to the content. Uh, so first of all, I want to highlight Prettier, of course. Uh, if you have not used Prettier yet, you definitely should try it right now because it's an amazing code formatter. So basically after installing Prettier plugins for just about any editor I'm using, I no longer even think about formatting. I just hit a save button and it auto formats everything for me. Um, and Prettier is amazing because it supports not just JavaScript, TypeScript flow, whatever, but also CSS less JSX, Vue, GraphQL, JSON, Markdown, and all of those combined. And it works really, really well. So this is definitely my number one uh, library, number one technology, uh, JavaScript related tool of the year. Now talking about editors, Visual Studio Code is not new. So it definitely not was, um, uh, so worth noting, Prettier was released in 2017. So it's pretty fresh and you know very new technology, but already like amazing. And they're nearing the 2.0 release, which is also really cool. Um, VS Code, even though it was not released in 2017, still uh, evolved so quickly and added so many cool features while remaining uh, very fast and very easy to hack because it is electron based uh, editor that I, I don't think I've even used any other editors that much. So I basically use VS Code for 99% of stuff and then for other 1% I have sublime text when I need to open something really large that VS Code doesn't really handle well. And I have other IDEs when I work with Java or, you know, something that requires like more complicated um, approach, even though um, VS Code, for example, has a pretty good Java plugin that does a decent job, let's call it this way. But sometimes for large projects, especially you do need a separate thing. Still, VS Code is my ID of choice and it is amazingly well made. And, you know, uh, it's kind of very surprising to say that this thing comes out of Microsoft, which is some, something I uh, think that not many of you would expect to see, um, would have expected to see like four or five years ago. But there we go. Thank you for Microsoft for keeping this project alive and uh, making an awesome editor. Next thing is, well, I mean, it's not exactly a technology. It's, um, I guess it is a technology, but this is directly JavaScript itself. It is ECMAScript 2015. And why I want to highlight it is because uh, most of the features that are in the ECMAScript 2015, including my favorite ones, destructing, rest, spread, and async await, are now usable in Node.js uh, without any transpilers or anything like this. So you can just use them without adding Babel or whatever, just natively, right? And this changed the way I develop stuff. So all my libraries, all my tools are now utilizing async await heavily. I'm using rest and spread everywhere. And it just made my life so much easier that, you know, even though this is technically just JavaScript, I wanted to highlight ECMAScript 2015 specifically because all of those features are amazing. And I Honestly, I can't wait to see what will come in the nearest future because uh, pipeline operator and some other things um, that are on a horizon, basically, and the proposals for ECMAScript seems to be like really, really uh, something that I would love. Next thing is not strictly JavaScript thing, but uh, related to front end. So Bulma is a free and open source CSS framework based on Flexbox. It's uh, pretty new, it's not even uh, 1.0 right now, and there's been quite a lot of breaking changes to it. But still, this is my framework of choice, not Bootstrap, uh, purely because this is pure CSS. So you need just one CSS file here, and you have, I think, pretty much everything that the Bootstrap offers. So you have columns, you have layouts, you have 
form areas, you have elements like buttons, notifications, and you have components including breadcrumbs, cards, dropdowns, and even models. Uh, caveat is that uh, it doesn't have JavaScript. So for example, in, in model case, you have to implement the model yourself. But when you're working with something like React.js, you don't really want like jQuery in it, right? So this works perfectly well. And uh, for example, using models from Bulma with React.js works amazingly good. So it's just like a match made in heaven, basically. Though this is my uh, CSS framework of the year. Right, speaking about React, uh, Next.js, um, server-side rendered and statically exported framework uh, for React by Zeitgeist is probably my most favorite React framework of the year because it allows you to really quickly build really complicated apps that would include server-side rendering, routing, and all that stuff without you even thinking about most of that. Works really well. Um, Quite well supported. I don't think I had any problems with it at all. I've used it in a more than one project now, and it's all of all of that been successful. And um, thanks to another library that you probably heard about, it's called Preact. Uh, it's a fast three kilobyte React alternative uh, by Jason Miller, I believe is his name. Uh, Jason Miller, yes, exactly. Who recently, by the way, got hired by Google to continue developing Preact, I hope. So if it's gonna be funded by Google, it's gonna be even better. Uh, so combining Preact with Next.js allows you to create extremely tiny and fast bundles. Uh, there is an example right here, Next.js examples files. There is way too many examples here. Act, please, there you go. Um, so replacing React with Preact is really easy so you can develop in uh, you know in dev environment using react and there will be no problems you can use your react dev tools or whatever you want there's a huge ecosystem and it's all nice and then once you switch to preact um all you really have to do is specify in the config that you want to resolve react and react dom as preact compat and that's it that gets you way tinier bundle and way faster load speeds which is really really nice uh so this is like a combo over year basically now let's talk about testing. Um, as you might know, I've mostly been using uh, Node Top, uh, but lately I've been switching to Jest because Jest has a bunch of features that make it um, all in one package essentially, right? So you no longer need to drag on your mocking libraries, you no longer need to drag on your snapshot testing libraries, and you no longer need to drag on um, some additional things that basically just has like parallel execution and so on and so forth. And even though, you know, Jest used to be very slow, latest versions, like I think last um, seven, eight versions, maybe even more, I haven't actually checked the exact version number, but they're really fast and really well developed. And um, there is even plugins uh, for VS Code, like VS Code Jest, that allow you to see the test execution in line and see the results of test as you coded, right? So here you can see that it executed it is green and you can actually see the output if you want, but that's optional basically. So this makes developing with Jest pretty delightful. I would even put it this way. I mean, they use the word delightful here, so I probably copied that from here. But anyway, this is my framework, uh, testing framework of choice in 2017 and it's probably I'm gonna keep going with it in 2018, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Maybe something better comes along. Right, next thing is uh, Tide PKG, um, maybe package, I guess I guess you read it package, right? So uh, basically it's a project that allows you to package your Node.js project into uh, one binary or one executable package. Um, it's, so the idea is that you can take the whole project and, and turn it into one executable file, right? One binary. And the cool thing about it is that you can target multiple platforms and the resulting size of a file is actually smaller than uh, your app and it starts faster because of some tricky things that go in the background. Um, the way I've been using it, so I'm gonna open another window, is I basically, I don't know if you've heard, but I'm maintaining a project called Exoframe, which is a self-hosted deployment tool has two parts. It has a server and it has a client, right? So the client is a command line tool which normally you install with npm install minus g. Uh, that's all good and all if you have Node.js. Uh, we have some people working with me who don't have Node.js installed. They don't like it. They don't want it, but they still want to use the deployment tool, right? So what I did is I packaged this uh, project using Node PKG. And as you can see here, we have three binary files, one for Linux, one for macOS, and one for Windows. And if we download this now, 
Uh, hopefully it should not take too long. Uh, we basically can execute it. This is one thing so that you basically, you don't need to install anything, right? You go to downloads and then you have this uh, ExoFrame macOS and you can say help and you will actually see that there you go, it works, right? So it's, it's very easy to uh, distribute among people who don't have Node.js. It is quite large, so like 40 megs, but you know, that's better than uh, installing Node and putting all the Node dependencies and it's faster. Now, the next thing is ExoFrame server. So this is a server part and it runs within Docker. Um, normally, you would have a Docker image uh, that uses Node app and it would be of size like a few hundred megabytes, right? ExoFrame server is just 30 megabyte of size because I used approach of pre-building the server into this binary and then just using Alpine base to just copy there. You don't need any other environment, right? In this case, there's a second line that installs Docker Compose, which is required, um, which is invoked basically by the server, but that's a different story. But basically you just copy your server and you run it and it works and it's Alpine, you know, so it's 30 megabytes. This is tiny. So uh, this is definitely like one of the best packages this year for distributing apps. Um, the next one would be Fastify. So I want to highlight this because I've been like looking for a better and faster um, HTTP framework, I've been using Happy for some time, I've been using Express for some time. Happy broke a lot of things with the latest release when they switched to async await and destroyed basically all the plugins ecosystem and some plugins are still not updated for the latest version, so it's a bit of a pain. Express is fine, but it doesn't really work too well with async await, so you have to create your own wrappers and stuff like this, which is a pain in ass to be honest. So here comes Fastify. It is uh, one of the fastest, so I think Faster than it is only micro and connect, which is not, I mean, it's not really frameworks, right? Micro is just a, a sync wrapper around HTTP. Connect is just a wrapper for middlewares and they don't have any routing or anything. And as you can see, the Fastify is one of the fastest. It has routing and it's actually not that far away by the throughput uh, from the native HTTP server. There are a few cool things about it. First of all, there's like a bunch of existing plugins. And second of all, it's compatible with all the Express middleware. So if you, if something is missing for Fastify, you can just take Express equivalent and plug it into Fastify and it will work. Uh, it is not yet version 1.0, I believe it's 0.37, but version 1.0 is coming very soon. I think they closed all the blockers and API is now more or less stable. The only thing that remains is basically documentation and there's some additional like grunt work, which is not too hard to do and shouldn't break anything. But yeah, my experience with it so far has been pretty great. I mean, the docs definitely could use some work, but they have a ticket for that and um, I'll try to help as much as I can. Definitely uh, my framework of a choice for the next year, I guess. And I mean, for all, all my projects that I've been using up until uh, now, once I discovered the Fastify and I'm working on Fastify because it's quite easy to get onto. And you know, the API is quite close to Express. And the last thing I want to talk about, which is uh, not strictly JavaScript thing. I mean, they do have a JavaScript client that you can install with, um, where is it? We with npm install minus G, um, where is it? Hmm npm install minus yes. So I think it's originated as npm client, but then they um, built the clients for just about any language, including the native on C++ client, which is what I'm using currently because it's just faster and doesn't pull half of npm along with it. But the cool thing is that's basically shorter man pages and community driven man pages, right? So for example, tar command, do you remember how to untar, untar the tar zip file? Um, hell if I do, but uh, if you just do tldr tar, you'll actually see a nice summary of how to create, extract, uh, zip, zip archive, and so on and so forth. And um, this package has like a lot of man pages. They're all hosted on GitHub, I believe, and it's very easy to contribute. So it even has like HTTP, um, HTTP client, which is you know, very nice user-friendly kernel replacement, for example. Very cool tool, uh, very easy to use. And uh, this is now my go-to man pages when I don't, you know, when, uh, when it's not about looking up something complicated, then obviously man would be better. But when it's like, hey, how do, what are the flags for tar and packing? <laughs> okay, so this basically wraps up the technology overview that were my, uh, my top technologies of 2017, obviously, you know, yours might be very well different. Some people are like, why don't you include TypeScript? Well, I didn't really write any TypeScript in 2017, but that's why. Uh, 
No, it doesn't make it any worse or, you know, it's like, it's actually a really good language, but I just didn't use it. So that's not my top. Um, now, here's what I want to talk about now. The thing is that I've been, uh, the way I've been structuring my work on this channel and the Twitch is a bit weird, feels a bit weird to me, right? So the way I've been doing it is I live stream something and I do it like for an hour or two. And then I do an episode on that. And I feel like that's just like duplicating the content. Um, so the question to you is, do you feel that this is a good way to go? Like, are you actually watching live stream? Um, are you happy with that approach? Because I have some suggestions. So uh, the idea would be to switch live streams for from doing something um, that precedes the episode to actually doing something completely different. So two ideas was one was uh, basically from me is that someone in advance sends me their code and I do a code review live on stream. Obviously your code will have to be free and open source and everything. So if you want paid work, then contact me separately. But if you are if you are trying to learn, if you want to improve and you want me to review your code, you just send it to me and we do a live stream and I slowly within hour, hour and a half, go through your code and give you a critique, right? So your typical code review. The other suggestion that came from a Twitch chat actually was also interesting is that we start a stream and then people come and uh, people right away suggest me something that we should build within this stream, which will be like two hours long or something. And I build it live. And then we, I don't know, maybe cover it in a video later. So the idea with um, YouTube videos then would be if we're doing code review, I could basically do a videos on um, common issues, like something that I see that, you know, can be easily evaded if you just keep, um, keep track of it. And talking about the app, I would basically build the app and then talk about it briefly on YouTube. So because it's, it's always really hard to figure out, you know, from your comments, what do you actually uh, like or not, I'm going to create the survey in uh, Google, and I'm going to put it in the description to this video. So go down there. And uh, please answer the survey so that we can make this channel better and uh, make it more useful to you. That's basically all I have for today. Thank you for watching me once again. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. And I see you in 2018. Bye.